very good Arabs, very good Palestinians. I met lots of them in my many travels in Gaza and in the Arab world. They're not sitting there every day thinking, how many Jews can I kill? Of course, there are movements that would like to encourage such things. But not every Palestinian, not every Arab thinks like that. And still like in all human beings, there are good ones, there are bad ones. Yes, there's a lot of stuff inside Islam that's extremely worrying. It depends to what extent the individual really takes that to be his task in life. Yes. Or whether it's some sort of general principle which he won't himself personally uphold. And I think you'll find, as I say, that it's not even possible to make peace with the Arabs in the sense of an absence of war not a love of peace, but an ability to feel it's not worth it. Yeah. And I think that's the best chance for Israel and for the Arabs. Paul Martin, welcome. Thank you very much. It's been um, a long chase to get you. I've, uh, I've asked you before, we've met before. It's been uh, a thrill to hear your stories, but finally here we've got you on tape for a, what I hope will be a fascinating episode. Well, I'll try to make it that <laughs> Well, one of the principal triggers for this episode was the assassination of Ismail Khania, the leader of Hamas, resident of Doha in Qatar. He was in Tehran for the inauguration of the new president. He met the Ayatollah, went back to his guest house. He was taken out in his bedroom with his security guard. Apparently the building is still standing, a targeted assassination in what we're understanding to be Mossad or Israeli style. And I thought, who knows Ismail Khania? I thought, I know someone who knows Ismail Khania. It's you, Paul. Yes, but I can start off by saying I, I first met him as a reporter. I'm a reporter who goes to various I suppose you could say dangerous places, not deliberately, it just happens to be my beef and uh, my beat. And so I've, I've been to uh, most of the Arab states as well as many other dangerous spots in the world. And Gaza was obviously a location I went to a lot during the Intifada, the second Intifada starting in 2000, up to 2005, 2006. And I continued going back and forward until 2010. And therefore, I got to know most of the leaders of Hamas. In fact, I could say that I know every single one of the leaders of Hamas, except for Sinwar, because he was in jail for some of the time I was uh, I was going back and forward. He was part of the Gilad Shalit prisoner swap, of course. So that, that yes. times when you were there. Yes. Well, he, he was released in 2011 then with the Gilad Shalit swap uh, amongst the 1,000 odd who were handed over in exchange for one Israeli young man prisoner. Uh, military. But while I was there, I would meet with people like Ismail Haniyeh. In fact, I made the very first profile film of Ismail Haniyeh when he became the prime minister of the Palestinian Authority. After they had won the election, the Hamas, against most people's expectations, had won an election in 2006 uh, and therefore technically became the rulers of the West Bank and Gaza. Although um, Mahmoud Abbas the president of the country, the proto-country, uh, which would have been called Palestine in his eyes, um, kept control of the military side of things and the, the armed forces, the police and so on. And it was only a year and a half later or so that this was changed by the overthrow of the troops that ran the Gaza Strip and uh, Abbas's people had to uh, leave or be arrested or killed uh, while Hamas took control. Now, just before that, there had been an attempt to create a unity government, and even before that, there had been officially a government uh, run by Hamas. Um, and I went and filmed him on the very first day of his uh, of his accession to the throne, as it were. And interestingly enough, I had a female translator with me who was wearing normal hair. And when we walked in, he said, no, 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 no. She's got to put on a headscarf. Now, my translator, to her eternal credit, said, no way. And she walked out the room and never came back. Wow. And, and she was an Arab Muslim Sunni yes, local. Local, yes. Brave girl. So we got a... Are you still in touch with her? Uh, no. Actually, I haven't spoken to her for a long time. Right. I don't know where she is. It would be lovely to know how her life formed, given that she was such a dissident in front of the leadership. Yes, I don't suppose it went down well. <laughs> the, um, the assistant to... Uh, Mr. Hania came along and he did the translation instead. Uh, we had an average sort of interview. He was being 
criticized at the time the, the quartet of the United States, Russia, United Nations. The Not us. It was, wasn't Britain. European Union? The European Union, exactly. Yeah. Those four were so a bit in, us in, in the old days. Yeah, in, in those days. In a quartet, they objected to having Hamas leading the Palestinian Authority because it wouldn't accept Israel as a, as a state, let alone a Jewish state, and would, would not give up the idea of conquering or overcoming Israel. So they didn't support the government. And he complained about that in my first interview, how unfair this was and so on. Um, and then he took me to see him playing volleyball. He was very keen to be shown as a sportsman. Now, yeah. He was also the Minister of Sport right. in, the, in the new Palestinian government, which he enjoyed doing. So he liked sport. Uh, and he tried to portray himself as a very uh, avuncular, friendly character. He lived in a very big, lovely house in, in the beach camp, uh, which has subsequently been destroyed by the mm. Israelis quite recently. Uh, but I went to his house a few times and uh, uh, got to know him relatively well. And uh, generally, he seemed to be on the moderate side of Hamas. At least he was expressing views which were not as radical. But I gradually realized this was more of a facade than anything real. Yeah, indeed. Now, he's been called a moderate over and over again by the BBC. Uh, it's interesting that you say that, that the, you know, the words he spoke were of a slightly less aggressive style. Although, again, there have been speeches which I've seen which... Uh, seem to belie that. Uh, it, it, this idea of moderate has, seems to have the fingerprints of people like John Simpson and Jeremy Bowen all over them. They seem to talk in those terms. But uh, he was, of course, the leader of the organisation who exacted the biggest mass murder of Jews since World War Two. He also <clears throat> was a very fiery preacher on a Friday morning. Right. Because he actually had a, a, sh a sort of qualification uh, as a preacher. Right. And he preached at the local mosque. I went a few times. Did you? Uh, and he... He was strong when he was mm. preaching. So he did have various facets. He was also, of course, the right-hand man to Sheikh Yassin. Now, Sheikh Yassin... The disabled former leader. Yes, the disabled former leader, who he would accompany everywhere he went. And he was rather fortunate that when Israel eventually took out Sheikh Yassin, uh, he wasn't present. Otherwise, he wouldn't be leading anything. Um, and uh, obviously that must have been a shocking experience for him, but they were expecting death, and he did frequently say that death is something which uh, a Muslim fighting a jihad should uh, be enthused about. Did you see his reaction when his three sons were killed? He almost looked as if, oh, well, that's happened, but oh. he just walked on and continued. Yes. So that kind of attitude that one is giving up one's life for Allah and for my cause, and I will get, of course, promotion, as it were, in heaven. Uh, the idea of 70 uh, black-eyed maidens, some say virgins. What people don't know is you also can get the forgiveness of 70 of your relatives. You can nominate. I don't know how many he left out. <coughs> but anyway, the fact, is, the fact is there's a tremendous plus to being a martyr, and right. he, would, he would be considered by his people as a martyr. What a revolutionary thought, which would be part of the Islamic Reformation, that actually you might be able to fulfill, ascribe your forgivenesses on earth, that you could have your black-eyed brides in life, as opposed to welcome and love death, which puts you at a perpetual state of war with whoever you nominate as your enemy. Well, they consider the enemy to be the Jews, but in particular, obviously, Israel, who support the Jews, which would be the Americans. So the, those would all be seen as enemies. Uh, but Hamas has not actually acted against the, anyone who's American specifically. They've acted against Jews, and they don't go to another foreign country and kill Jews. That's more Hezbollah. They have done that a few times, Argentina. But they've threatened Bavaria. to do it, haven't they, in recent times? I don't think they've ever said they will go to a foreign country and kill Jews. They, they would certainly feel it's, it's part of their normal behavior to, to kill Jews who are supporting the state of Israel. They wouldn't see them as an exception. They wouldn't say, just because you're living in America, we won't kill you. But they've made no specific effort to do so. However, of course, Jews who live in Israel are automatically considered to be equivalent to settlers, Zionists who've occupied Palestinian land, and therefore they are fair game. I, I met uh, Hania a few times, including at a funeral 
where he actually was trying to patch up things because he was from Hamas and Hamas and Fatah were the two organizations who actually had a lot of clashes. And the funeral was of a, fa a Fatah fighter who'd gone to the front line and been shooting rockets at Israel and been killed. And uh, he came specifically to the funeral of a Fatah man. But when I interviewed him, he expressed very strong views. And, you know, we'll get revenge, we'll fight back, the, the, you know, we, we'll, we'll get our revenge on these Jews and so on. So he spoke strongly at a funeral. But generally, in public, he was more careful. Um, so I was rather surprised in the end, and I'll come to this perhaps, when um, he was responsible for my being locked up and uh, put in a prison cell. Indeed. I mean, you know, you had friends in high places in Hamas. And yet uh, one of the reasons perhaps you knew Hanier was one of the reasons actually that you ended up in the nick. Yes. <clears throat> well, Hanier had problems at that time. This was 2010. And you may, you may know that in 2010, Israel had allegedly, uh, obviously, truly they did, assassinated a top Hamas official who had been operating through Damascus and Tehran, but he was on his way uh, from Damascus to Tehran, stopped off in uh, uh, United Arab Emirates in Dubai, and then you see the pictures of these Israeli tennis players, as they pretended to be, uh, coming through customs, going to the hotel and killing this particular operative. Now, this is relevant to me because clearly the internal security operation of Hamas was embarrassed, to say the very least, by failing to protect him. And I had come to Gaza to make my usual reportage, but I was also filming, I might say secretly filming, a rocket-firing militant called Mohammed, surprisingly, who um, had been firing rockets at Israel in a Fatah group that was sanctioned or authorized by Hamas. They would allow them to continue those operations, so they would restrict their training program, actually. Uh, but they used to fire rockets into Israel. And he was a young man who was well-educated and had been firing rockets. And I'd filmed him a couple of years before, a year and a half before, firing rockets uh, and saying afterwards that he'd love to do more of it. It was his first operation and so on. And suddenly in, in 2010, after the, 2009, sorry, after the Israelis had finished a particular war, which lasted, I think, 27 days, um, I'd got into Gaza City again just after the ceasefire. They weren't allowing journalists in at that point. And uh, I was sitting in a cafe and I got a tap on the shoulder and the voice behind said, Hi, it's Muhammad. Well, as I said, this doesn't cut the field down very Not much. Not too far. So I turned around and I said to him, Oh, Muhammad, oh, yes, you're, you're the <laughs> rocket, the guy that yeah. was firing rockets that I filmed a year and a half ago. He said, Yes. I said, Did oh, you say that in English or, or, or in English. Arabic? Well, he spoke yeah. very good English. Right. And he, and he said, Yes, it's me. I said, um, He didn't say it very loud, though. I mean, it didn't make well, people turn round. Well, no, the fact that he was firing rockets into Israel was a good thing. Oh, I see. So, so it makes him the... Uh... The local population would say, well, well done. Yes. Yeah. Mabruk. Yeah. Mabruk. Yes. Yeah. And anyways, there he was. <laughs> I said to him, um, it's nice to see you again. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm making a new film. And this time I could already see that the film that I was going to make was probably going to be contrary, contrary to many other films because I was going to be very objective and fair, as I always am in journalism. And there was a story that was being told by the foreign correspondents which didn't seem to fit the facts already. I said, I'd like to go and see your unit because uh, they took part in the fighting. He said, yes. And uh, I've filmed with them before, as I say, firing rockets and in other places. Uh, can I go and see them? So he said, well, I'm not a member of any unit. So I said, what do you mean you're not a member of any unit? I, I filmed you firing rockets yeah. into Sderot. It's an Israeli town. Um, and he said, uh, yes, but I've changed my mind. I'm not a member of the group. I've resigned. Now I thought, you can't resign mm. from a militant group to whom you've sworn loyalty till death us do part. Um, they have proper ceremonies and everything. To, and you know where people are, who they are, who's in them, where their weaponry is, and so on. You can't just resign. It's not like leaving the Boy Scouts or something. So I said, you can't, can't have resigned. He said, yes, I have. And what's more, I want you to make a film about why uh, I've changed my mind. Right. So I thought, what? I mean, we have a saying in journalism that if a 
dog bites a man, it's not much of a story. If a man bites a dog, it's more of a story. Yes. So here's a rocket-firing militant who's now trying to tell me he's changed his mind, and I've been to 12 different conflicts or more at that point around the world, and I've never met a militant, I'm calling using that word advisedly, I've never met a militant who's ever told me he's changed his mind, and let alone wants to be filmed explaining why he's changed his mind. So I thought, this is a very interesting story, and it could add another interesting element to my reportage. On the other hand, it's surely very dangerous for him. So I said, you must be crazy, you'll be in trouble. He said, I'm already in trouble. I said, well, you'll get into worse trouble. He said, I couldn't be in any worse trouble. Actually, he was wrong, he could. Mm. But um, mm. I said, look, I don't think it's a good idea. I am a journalist, but I don't want to get you into awful trouble, so I'm not going to do it. And Think about it, though. If you phone me in two days' time and you really want to do the story, I'll do it. I didn't think he'd phone me, but two days later he phoned. He said, yes, yes, I want to do it. So I did the story with Muhammad secretly. I had my camera, a small camera. I didn't use my usual yes. crew. And uh, it, it gradually worked A out. single shot on him. Yes. Yes. And, and uh, he took me to places where they fired the rockets from, explained that they used to fire into a state rock. They didn't have guidance systems, so they would easily kill civilians. Uh, which he wasn't very keen on. And then they would position themselves where Fatah people used to live and then move their rocket-firing equipment as soon as they'd fired and hope that the Israelis would fire back at them and kill not them but the Fatah people right. in the house next door, etc. So that would be serving a double purpose. He, he didn't like any of this. But then he became friendly in the end on the Internet with somebody very interesting. He had... He was a technical expert. In fact, he, his original job in the unit that he was with was to find targets to fire at through Google Earth, um, which he did. But as I say, the equipment wasn't that good anyway. Um, and then he became graduated to go and firing the rockets. And then he realized, hang on, I'm not very keen on this. But he was working for an American company that was able to help solve problems computer problems around the world with people who had computer problems or phone problems and they would use a bunch of freelancers around the world to solve problems whoever could solve got paid better money and this sort of thing and he was doing it and he noticed that there was a guy in Tel Aviv doing it and they started to talk to each other and now the Palestinian had never met an Israeli physically on, on, on the ground and the same with the Israeli had never met a Palestinian they started to talk. At first they were suspicious of each other, rather. And then they started to explain their lives and things that they had in common. The only thing Muhammad didn't tell the guy in Israel, we were called Dan, um, was that he was firing rockets right. uh, okay. at the Israelis. Okay. Other than that, they were very frank. <laughs> and then he started to think to himself, why exactly am I firing rockets at Israeli civilians when I have a friend now in Tel Aviv? Yes. He said this didn't make sense. I've got to work out. Either I've got to get rid of my friend in Tel Aviv or I've got to stop firing rockets. And eventually, after some anguish, he decided to stop firing rockets. But that's a good story, right? It's an interesting yes. story and it's quite encouraging. Very interesting. Um, I even then went to see the guy in Tel Aviv and asked him, did he mind if I filmed the two of them talking to each other on the internet, which yes. they used to do? And they both agreed. Actually, the guy in Tel Aviv wanted to disguise his face because he didn't want his unit because he was although he'd finished his army service he gets called up for two, a month's training every year or yeah, whatever Milwin. and he um, he decided to um uh, change his face into a cat or something like that <laughs> and they did a link up which i filmed and i asked muhammad while he's making that uh interview while they were talking i said what happens if you get found out talking to this israeli he said oh it's death yes and they don't even bother with the trial usually so i filmed it and then I realized, hang on, how am I going to broadcast this film? If I put this film on air, they'll kill him. Because they'll see him talking to an Israeli and they'll yes. suspect that he's some kind of a spy or something. So I, I knew I couldn't run the film at that point. But I continued filming and he, he realized he was in bigger and bigger trouble because Hamas had found out he'd left the group. He was being interrogated. He decided to go to escape. He went to the tunnels, which run between Gaza, the Gaza Strip and Egypt and asked if he could go through the tunnels. I filmed him about to go through the tunnels. Uh, I, I, was this in Rafah? This is in Rafah. Yeah. So he went uh, down into the tunnel. They said, okay, $1,000. He said, I don't have $1,000. 
Now, I knew that if he got to Egypt and if he was able to, to get out of Gaza, I had more chance of my film being shown. So it was worth much more than $1,000 to me if I lent him 1000 or gave him $1,000. I thought of giving him 1000 and then I said, no, then I become involved yes. in the process. I'm a journalist. I'm objective. I don't back anybody in this war. I'm here to report the truth, what's really happening. I'm not giving him the money. I can't do that. It's wrong. And also, by the way, it could also backfire if they ever found out that I was giving him money to escape. But but more I was worried about was the morality. I'm a journalist. It's not my job. So he couldn't leave through the Gaza tunnels. Um, I went back to England a couple of times during this, this filming operation because I was doing other reporting. And I suddenly get a text message on my phone which says, Hi, Paul. I think I'm about to be arrested and executed. Right. This is Mohammed. Yours, uh, thank you for everything. Oh dear, Mo. Right. I thought, oh my God, this is bad. I mean, I knew he might get arrested, but yeah. now he's getting arrested. It turned out he was arrested because we phoned his sister. He disappeared, and so on and so forth. Sixty days later, he was found in a rather tortured condition in a prison and uh, wrecked, uh, a wreck of a man, as his brother later described. But they accused him of being a spy or collaborator with Israel, which is the standard thing you would do. However, I knew he wasn't a spy, because why would a spy want a foreign correspondent like me to make a film about why he's left the group that he should have stayed in if he was a spy anyway? Yeah. Why would he want a Western correspondent to put a thing like that on television, which would definitely get him into trouble and wouldn't encourage the spy agency because they would obviously want him to stay in his unit. So I, I thought, this is ridiculous. Anyway, the fact is, later on, they decided not to kill him, which they normally do, but to put him on a military trial and make a kind of show trial of it. Yes. And then, of course, execute him, which would be the normal process. And I thought, well, there's a possibility I could save his life by explaining to the court, military court, they have military courts and everything in Gaza, by the way, that they had, um, explaining why it couldn't possibly be a spy. Maybe a dissident, maybe give him 10 years, because he's a bad boy to be a dissident. Sure. But to be a spy, uh, I might save his life. I thought about it for a while. Do I have a responsibility to go and do this? And I thought, look, there's not much danger for me. Why? Because Hamas needs people like me. They need foreign correspondents to go there and to portray the picture that they want the world to see, which is that they're in a big prison surrounded by the Israelis. They don't usually mention the Egyptians also have a yeah. border and so on. And, and therefore, people like us going there to Gaza are part of their own propaganda operation. They need us there. Yeah. So why would they do anything to me? The worst that could happen is they would reject my evidence, tell me never to come back. My wife would be thrilled to bits. <laughs> and yes. and uh, there I would be kicked out of the country, okay. But at least I could try and save this guy's life, though it was a, a long shot. When I got there, the trial uh, was taking place periodically of this guy. I went to the court, having written before, by the way, went to the court and then found out that uh, I wasn't in a normal position. They said, no, you're not going into the court to give evidence because you are an accused. I said, accused of what? It's a guy in a military uniform, black uniform, from Hamas. You're accused of being Muhammad's spy master. Right. Now, I didn't, at that point, quite realise how bad this was going to be. So I said, well, why would a spy come to give evidence in a court you know, to, for a guy who's already locked up? Uh, what spy agency would be so yes. stupid? Anyway, that logic didn't work. No. They put handcuffs on me. The guy who was with me was actually from um, Human Rights Watch because he'd come to see the trial. Um, and I, I'd invited him to come with me. Ken Roth's people. No, it his people, yes. But he left uh, soon after they put the handcuffs on me. Luckily, because he was able to tell the British consulate what had happened in the British consulate in East Jerusalem. Otherwise, I might have disappeared. As it was, I was taken to a cell. And that was the night I had my first mock execution. Oh, my gosh. They put a gun to my head and put bullets in the, in the barrel of the gun. I thought, what's going to happen? I had my hands cut. Yes. I thought, uh, and then he started to pull, he put the gun to my head and he started to pull the trigger. Right. This was a Mental torture of the worst kind. Kalashnikov. And he held, the, he held the trigger there halfway. 
And I thought, you know, I didn't have any great visions of the past and, you know, my life didn't run through my mind. I was just thinking, when's the bang? And it seemed to be a long time before he pointed the gun in the air, oh. laughed, and smashed the barrel of the gun on my knee, which oh. I had later had to have an operation on. But I was rather thrilled to have my knee smashed up rather than my head shot through. Yes. So it's all relative. So that was my first night of, uh, of uh, 26 days that ended up of, in, of being accused, interrogated, uh, hearing torture all around me, not being sure whether they were going to torture me or not, another mock execution, and so on. I'm not going to go into all the details now, because we're coming back to the subject of Mr. Hania. He was in charge of the Gaza Strip at that point. Yes. Cause so really, he knew about you, and he knew why he you were there, and he, me, he knew your misappropriation there. to being the accused rather than being... Yes. And he did nothing. Nothing. Or nothing to help me, which I was surprised, because I expected that the Hamas bosses knew me well enough yeah. to say, well, hang on, you've got the wrong guy. He couldn't possibly have done this. They did nothing. So after... Um, after 22 days, a Hamas official turned up in my office, who I, when I knew, not my office, in his office, which was in the prison, the prison right. this was a secret prison, by the way, run by internal security. And I was taken out of my cell, which was not exactly a pleasant place, but I was taken to... Were you office. solitary in your cell? I was or? totally solitary in yeah. my cell all the time, except for a very short period where they threw a prisoner in who was shaking and obviously had been tortured. Right. And, um, actually, he's a, lo- he's a lovely story because he... After asking for me, could I use your mattress? Mattress was that thin, tiny yeah. little thin mattress, and I had to move over to where the insects were coming out of a hole. It was supposed to be a toilet. Anyway, he laid on this, and after 10 minutes, this poor shaking individual had stopped shaking so much. He said, I have something to give you. He spoke Arabic to me. I know some Arabic. And he said, uh, I said, well, what can this poor wretch give me? He pulled out of his pocket a plastic bag. In the plastic bag, there were six dates he said, have some. He gave me three of his six dates. Do you know what that meant? That meant he gave me half of everything he owned in the world wow. at that point. Wow. I thought, what a great guy. Yeah. And they tasted great, by the way. Um, so even in these horrible situations, you see some beautiful humanity wow. every, every now and then. Wow, that is uh, so, so to come back to Hania, Hania was obviously doing nothing to help me. And I wasn't sure whether they had decided to execute me or not, because they told me they were going to execute me. Uh, In fact, they were very proud to tell me that the execution would take place under a British law, (laughs) because under the mandate period, there'd been an emergency law, which was still in application, apparently, in Gaza, (laughs) under which you could execute people who were accused of espionage and so on. And did you have an opportunity in these 22 to 26 days of incarceration to call the family and say... Uh, you haven't heard from me because I'm in the nick in Gaza. Well, fortunately, as I said, because I was known to be arrested, uh, the British consulate uh, knew that I was there. They came to visit me. They promised that they would contact my wife. Uh, and they also brought me a couple of things. Um, but they were only able to come once. And they, they did contact my wife. My wife was actually phoned in the, in the same place. Well, not the same house, but in London. Uh, by the foreign office, and they said, uh, we've got bad news for you, your, your husband has been arrested, and it's going to be on Sky Television in about 10 minutes. We thought we'd better tell you first. Right. So that was how she found out that I'd been arrested on Valentine's Day, by the way. <laughs> That's a nice <laughs> gift. Yes. Um, and, uh, I mean, if I did anything like that... Would you be so foolish? I like to do interviews like this. Uh, <laughs> I've met and known some remarkable people, and... The miracle of being able to put on a tape machine and sit down and have a good old-fashioned conversation about first-hand experiences. So I, I, I am gripped by this, and this is entirely consistent with all the previous episodes. It's, it's an incredible story. But I can sort of understand why Hanie wouldn't lift a finger for you, because everything seems so risk-averse there. The idea, well, what's in it for me? I may as well keep quiet. Why yes. would I want to well, save him, even though he was my mate, even though he yes. well, shot he me doing basketball shots yeah. and everything? Yeah. Well, the reason he wanted to keep me there was for another reason, and that was, as I mentioned to you, there'd been this incident in the United Arab Emirates where an Isra- some Israelis had knocked off a Palestinian... Hamas guy who was doing deals between Iran and getting weaponry and whatever else in, they decided to kill him, they did. It was a Mossad operation, one assumes. Um, His body had been taken back to Damascus 
just a few days before I was locked up, accused of being the master spy looking after Muhammad. And they put two and two together and they made 22, if you see what I mean. Yes. And they said, hang on, we're being attacked and criticized for having failed to protect our guy in uh, Dubai, who was being murdered. We've got this guy locked up. Okay, he's not a spy, really. We know that. They put they knew that really from the start. Right. But he's convenient. Why don't we say he is the guy who ran the whole operation to kill the guy in in uh, Dubai, and we'll execute him. Right. And then we'll tell everybody we've, we've caught the main culprit. That would give them more kudos. It might also get them more benefits from Iran, who would say congratulations or, or Mabruk or whatever. Yeah. And so I was quite a convenient, literally, scapegoat Gosh. who could be executed for that reason. Not so much because I was helping uh, make a film about Muhammad, which was really um, small beer, but this was a much bigger one. So they told me about this, and they asked me how I'd been involved in killing this person in uh, Dubai, which I said was ridiculous, yeah. which of course it was. But it didn't really matter if it was true or not. If I was dead, I could hardly argue about it. And if yes. I signed a confession, then they could present this. And I was just wondering whether they were going to make me sign a confession by torture or not. They presented a confession to me in Arabic, which I don't read, and they said, sign that. And I said, I will refuse to sign that. Now, I didn't know whether they are going to torture me into signing it or, yes. or not, but uh, I said, this is like signing a death sentence, yes. a, a death warrant, you know, a warrant for my death. So I didn't sign it. I didn't know what's going to happen next. They took me to a much worse cell later on um, and so on and so forth, but they never actually inflicted full torture on me, just psychological pressures. Uh, various things were done to put more and more pressure on me. But they probably had an instruction, maybe from Hania, or maybe not, you can interrogate the guy, you can give him as hard a time as you want, but don't actually physically torture him. I thought the reason they didn't want to physically torture me might be because when my dead body was returned to Britain, they didn't want to see too many marks and bad things on it, which would give them negative publicity. However, there are forms of torture that don't leave marks, and uh, I wasn't sure what they were going to try. And I could hear torture going on in the neighboring cells uh, around me, and some of my guards were laughing and amused by the torture. Yes. So I knew I wasn't far off it. And then coming back to the subject of Hania, the on the 22nd day, I suddenly got this guy coming into a part of the prison. I went to see him. It turned out to be Ahmed Yusuf, who was uh, chief advisor to the prime minister. And he said to me, Paul, because he knew me, well, all of these people knew me by my first name. Paul, um, the prime minister has asked me to come and find out your side of the story. <laughs> Would you like to tell me? So I told him how it had all happened, and I kind of made it sound a little bit apologetic, but I didn't lie. I just explained that. The guy in Tel Aviv. You know, I, didn't, I didn't even mention the guy in Tel Aviv, but I did say that uh, you know, maybe it was a bit unwise to be trying to film a man who had the temerity to leave his militant group. But, right. But I decided to do it because it seemed like a good story. And I don't know. Anyway, so I told him the story. The end of which he said, Paul, tell me, um, would you like to speak to your wife? And then he produced his, if you don't mind the pun, cell phone, um, <laughs> and uh, and said, you can phone her. Right. Said, wow. So I picked up the phone, I dialed, and she answered the phone. In London? In London. And so I said, darling, it's me. Oh, my God, how are you? Where are you? What are you doing? I said, look, I've been, I'm in the company of the uh, chief advisor to the prime minister. I'm in a prison, as you know. Hi, Paul. Yes, I'm just going to interrupt. The same wife is now yeah, talking yeah, to me. Your part is being mentioned, darling. <laughs> Sorry. Just to say, we are coming, and in the 10 minutes I'll be finished. Oh, we need yeah. to leave by 20 minutes. Thank you. Right. You see that the wife is the boss. Yeah, absolutely. We've got theatre tickets. Yes, okay, theatre tickets. This is wonderful. <laughs> anyway, so let me, let me speed up the uh, discussion. And they even mentioned that Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa has written a letter of complaint to Hamas about my arrest. Now, Tutu was the most anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian international figure you yes. could get, apart from Ahmadinejad. I would have been happy to have had Ahmadinejad on my side. <laughs> uh, but in that case, having Tutu, who'd been to Gaza and various other things, writing to the Prime Minister, sounded like a good idea. So I thought, oh, here's an opportunity. Here's the advice to the Prime Minister. I said, it's so good that Archbishop Desmond Tutu has written a letter of protest to Hamas. The reason he wrote a letter, by the way, was because I was a friend of his son. Um, I, had a, I had an anti-apartheid record, a strong one, right in South Africa when I grew up there. So he knew me. And his son knew me very well. And he'd got his father to write this letter. 
which I discovered later. So I said, it's so great that Archbishop Desmond Tutu has written a letter of protest to Hamas. And then I added, and it's so good that Nelson Mandela is doing the same. I fibbed. Yes, that was a little, <laughs> little fib. little fib. But I, at that moment, uh, Mr. Yusuf said, Dr. Yusuf said, Paul, can I use the phone? So I said, well, it's your phone. He took the phone. He said, uh, Mrs. Martin, this is Dr. Yusuf, advisor to the Prime Minister. So she said quite rightly and cleverly, she said, when are you releasing my husband? He said, we're having a cabinet meeting tomorrow with the military there and we'll make a decision uh, tomorrow and we'll let you know. So I put the phone down. As I'm walking out, I'm thinking, is there some kind of a deal on the, uh, on the card? So he said to me, Paul, if you were to be released, what would you say about Hamas? Um, I said, uh, nothing. And he said, well, why would that be? I said, it wouldn't be good for me. Mm. He said, that's good that you appreciate that. Because, you know, you're very fortunate you're in the hands of a moderate organization like ourselves. Right. However, our um, military do have a connection, strong connections with other uh, militaries in the area. And they tend to take a more aggressive view on things. And we know where you live. We know where your people go to university, your, your daughter. We know where your wife works. I said, you don't have to go any further. Yes. That's exactly why I would say nothing about Hamas. If I were released, what about prison conditions? I said, I wouldn't discuss that. Yes. He said, good, I will convey this to Mr. Hanier. Next day, I, I waited, nothing happened. So I thought, oh, well, of course, they might have had a cabinet meeting in which the military would say, no, 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 we've got this guy, we need to execute him, we've got yes. good reasons. And military usually wins in that kind of situation. So but I said, don't even think about it. This is just a form of torture. They're trying to persuade you they're going to do something nice. And then it doesn't happen and then it puts you in a psychologically difficult spot. The next morning, uh, uh, they took me in a false ambulance, by the way, which actually is a disguised ambulance, which was disguised, which was actually a military vehicle disguised as an ambulance. Right. Yeah. And they took me to, a, to the same place where Muhammad had originally been put on trial. And that was behind bars. And I thought, oh, now they're going to have the little trial. Yes. They're going to convict me of being a spy. And then they execute you usually half yes. an hour later or something. So I thought that's the end of that. And I saw my lawyer. I had a lawyer, a Palestinian lawyer, who'd been banned from seeing me after two sessions. It turned out to be an excellent man, by the way. I said, what's going on? He said, uh, I've applied for bail. I said, bail? Are you, are you serious? He said, well, I've applied. So they started the case. And they said, uh, this, this accused has applied for bail. So the prosecutor, who was the same man who'd seen me 21 days before, said, um, why should we give bail to a spy? And the judge, also dressed in the same black uniform, uh, said, quite right, case denied. End of case. So I thought, OK, well, it's better than being sentenced to death. Yes. <laughs> just yes. using bail. OK, and I'll just take me back to my cell, I hope. So uh, the lawyer managed to see me in the corridor afterwards. And, and I said to him, nice try to get me a bail. He said, it doesn't really matter. I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? It matters a lot. He said, no, no, no. Um, you're going to be released tomorrow anyway. I said, what? Did you know about the cabinet meeting yesterday? They, right. He said, I know about it. They're going to release you tomorrow. I thought, okay, this is some kind of trick. Maybe they, Hamas have told them they're going to release me and they're not really. This is one of those psychological games. He said, 10.30 tomorrow, the British are coming. And wow. he walked out. Wow. And 10 o'clock, I said, Paul, don't even think about it. It's not going to happen. And you're just being a fool to yes. even think about it. The more I said, not don't think about it, the more I did. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> of happened. course. Got to 10.30. I said, don't look at your watch, but I did. And it was 10.30, 10.45, 11 o'clock. I said, you idiot. This is just a trick. They're going to kill you. You know that. So it got to 11.05 and the door opened and the prison chief was there. And he said, Paul, you go London. Amazing. And closed the door. I thought he was another trick. Ten minutes later, he came back. He says, Paul, you go England. <laughs> and then ten minutes later, he brought me toothpaste, toothbrush, a comb, a new tracksuit. I thought, my God, they're going to release me. And they're going to make it look like I was on a Mediterranean cruise or something. <laughs> other, because I was on the Mediterranean Sea. Wow. Anyway, they did. They took me out. To cut a long story short. They took me out. They gave me a further interrogation. They tried a few last tricks. Didn't work. And they took me to the house of one of the top members of Hamas, who um, probably is also dead now. Um, and uh, 
drove me out of Gaza eventually after an hour and a half and people were taking photographs of me and you'll see them on the internet and at the end I, I, I finally realized I was going to be released but I was still inside Gaza I got a phone call my lawyer ran over to me with a phone call from the man that seen me on the 21st day saying Paul you remember the um he first he said congratulations I said thank you Dr. Yusuf and he said uh Remember the conversation we had about the press and what to say or not nothing. to say? Nothing, yeah, nothing. I said, I remember it. So I went outside and I said, there was a huge crowd of TV crews, you'll yeah. see it all on, on the internet. And I said, um, I'll not be answering questions, I'll make a statement. And I made a statement which ran something like this. I prepared it in the in the van, in the, which I'd been taken to the border with. I said, uh, my release today is a great, is a great, I'm trying to think exactly what I said. My release today is a great victory, a victory for the right of journalists to be able to report accurately and fairly on situations where they're being uh, pressurized by hardline groups or militants or governments. And my release today should also be seen as a great victory for other journalists around the world, of which there are about a 100 who are being held by militant groups against their wishes and because of their reporting. And I call for them to be released today just as I am being released. Thank you very much. That was my speech. You can see some of it. So the first question some journalist with a camera crew shouts out, Paul, how are you treated by Hamas? Right. <clears throat> first test. Oh, my gosh. So I, think, <laughs> so I said, no comment, which is a comment, if you see what I mean. Uh, well, yes. And then he said, were you tortured by Hamas? And I said, no comment which is a bigger comment. Yes, it is. <laughs> and then he said, are you afraid to be talking to us because of being in Hamas custody? And I said, no comment, which is also a comment. At which point the British said, let's go, let's go, let's go. They had the British vehicles yeah. there. They yeah. took me yeah. out in the vehicle, drove me across the border to freedom. And um, Egyptian or Israeli? No, the, across the Israeli border. Yes. yes into, into areas, which is much closer. Areas than, crossing. Yeah, much closer. So that's the whole summarized story of what happened in those 26 days. That but I was angry that Mr. Hania had done nothing to, to support me. Yes. Um, but that is insight into Palestinian insight society, into isn't Palestinian it? Palestinian society at that time. Yes. No, they wouldn't bother with the trial or... No. You know, they, wouldn't have, they would have just shot me dead They'd if they wanted you. to and forged, uh, forged a confession if they needed Sure. So two quick questions as we finalise a, a, a brilliant talent. Thank you very much for relaying it so vividly for our audience. What's happened to Mohammed? Ah, two good questions. Firstly, you've asked one good question. I'm going to I've got add, another I'm, one I'm, in a moment. Oh, okay, I'm going to add an extra one. Okay. Okay, Mohammed is alive. Good. I spoke to him, communicated with him a few days ago. He is in, managed to escape after 12 years. He is now in another country. Okay, good. I'm very happy to say And that. we're not going to be I able helped, to say where I that is. I helped save his life. Wonderful. By launching a campaign to save him once I was released... Uh, and it, it battled. The British government did nothing to help him. They wouldn't even let him come to give a talk to the parliamentarians that I wanted him to talk to. He had to stay in wherever he was. Uh, but eventually, he managed to get out. And by the way, he was worried about fleeing into into Egypt because he would be arrested in Egypt because he didn't have a visa, and they would treat him even worse than they would in a Palestinian prison. Yes. was his worry. And eventually, he got out. So he's out. That's something I'm proud about because in a way I've saved his life which yes. is something I'm pleased he was did. a dissident what of Gaza was your second, question? second question was I'm wondering if your wanderlust for going to Gaza is quelled post October the 7th well that's a very good question you can't really test yourself yet again there now it's just not for you well and you're outed a little bit aren't you Paul well uh, outed what, what have I done I'm a journalist of full uh, who's been very objective all my journalistic career so journalistically it's not the problem the problem is that somebody might read uh, you were held by Hamas and you were, therefore must be guilty and therefore will kill you. But that was also a worry I had when traveling around the rest of the Middle East. However, the interesting thing was in 2012 and then 2014, I actually met with a deputy head of Hamas who was in Cairo. And the amazing thing is he gave me an interview the first time. I did a very straight interview. It was published in, the magazine, in Time magazine, actually. Uh, as you can read, and a fairly straight interview. At the end of the interview, I said to him, tell me, why did you guys lock me up? He wasn't based in, 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 in uh, Gaza at that time. Right. He was outside. But anyway, so why did you guys lock me up? Well, you knew perfectly well I'm not a spy. So he said to me, Paul, um, how long did you spend in our prison? I said, 26 days. He said, ah, 
26 days. I spent 26 months in an American <laughs> prison. Right. I thought there's a difference. I don't control America. You control Gaza. You control Hamas, sorry. I said. He said, yes. Do you ever want to go back? I said, well, I'm a journalist. Yeah, why not? He said, I'll see what my guys can organize. He phoned his people in Gaza. He phoned me back. The head, deputy head of Hamas phones me, the ex-prisoner, back. And he says, Paul, I'm sorry. Our guys in Gaza think it wouldn't be a good idea. Which I just tended to agree with. Yes. Two years later, there was another war. I interviewed him again in Cairo. And, and almost jokingly, I said to him, well, what happened to that offer you were going to let me go back to Gaza? He said, I'll call my people again. Two days later, he sends a text message to me saying, Paul, you're invited to go to Gaza. So I contacted him and said, oh, I'm not going to go unless I go with you personally because I'm worried about my safety. He said, no, 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 just go to the border and it's all organized. I said, which border? He said, go to the Israeli border, go to Ares. I said, don't you want me to go from Egypt? He said, no, the Egyptians are much more difficult about getting people into Gaza than the Israelis. Go by the Israeli route. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, I spent 24 hours inside Gaza, which itself would be another half hour show um, on, on your program. But I got out again the second time and I decided not to go back to Gaza. No. Even during this war. No. I think I'll keep out of that place I think you've for the got, rest of my life. I think you've got lots of lovely memories of it. Well, maybe there's an opportunity for a sequel uh, to this magnificent, gripping episode. Can I just ask you for your opinion on Chaviv Retigura's statement about what Jewish people are thought of by Palestinians, by Arabs. We're not people to them. We're not complicated. We have no history, no mind, no rhyme or reason. We're just moral cartoons, a vocabulary for talking about their own anxieties and convictions and inadequacies. And that's why they can speak about our destruction with such wistful yearning and not feel like monsters. Arab discourse in government, in journalism, in academia, uh, nowhere in Arab society anywhere to try to figure out what they might be missing about us, why we keep defining this expectation. Okay, I'm going to disappoint you somewhat. Please. I'm going to tell you that there are very good Arabs, very good Palestinians. I met lots of them in my many travels in Gaza and in the Arab world. You can't compartmentalize all Arabs as being absolute determined to kill Jews. Most of the time they're worrying about their families, their, uh, yes. their ability to, to have a good living, to educate their kids and so on and so forth. They're not sitting there every day thinking, how many Jews can I kill? Of course, there are movements that would like to encourage such things, but not every Palestinian, not every Arab thinks like that. And still like in all human beings, there are good ones, there are bad ones. I even met a very good a guy in the prison uh, who was a prison officer, complained about having to serve in this prison. We didn't like torture going on and things like that. And I, and I thought I was about to die in a few days. I thought, well, I'll offer to do something for him. He had a bad back. I offered to give him a back massage, right. which I did. Right. And he, he complained bitterly about having to work for this organization, but that was his job. Right. So I've been warned. I've got a one-minute warning. So, so there are good ones. There are bad ones. I wouldn't generalize about the entire Arab population. No. Yes, there's a lot of stuff inside Islam that is extremely worrying. It depends to what extent the individual really takes that to be his task in life. Yes. Or whether it's some sort of general principle which he won't himself personally uphold. And I think you'll find, as I say, that it's not impossible to make peace with the Arabs in the sense of an absence of war, not a love of peace, but an ability to feel it's not worth it. Yes. And I think that's the best chance for Israel and for the Arabs. Paul, that is a magnificent and enlightened way to end this episode. And thank you very much indeed for joining us here on... Thank you. It's something I'm looking forward to. Even more than being on your show is going to the theatre. Enjoy yourself. Thank you.